Good to see everybody out this morning uh, here at church. Beautiful day on the outside and good, good to be in God's house this morning. I uh, do want to just quickly say, if you uh, let's remember Hugh in prayer. He's in hospital, not really sure what's going on with him. I did call and they, uh, the nurses said that he was okay, but I, they were going to be doing some testing and things to see what's going on with him, so let's keep him in prayer. Um, they're not allowing any, anybody to come up to the to hospital right now, so we uh, just keep praying for him, keep checking in on him, and we'll keep you updated as to what's, uh, what's going on with him as we find out. Uh, but let's go to the Lord in prayer and just ask his blessing upon the service today. And then we'll go into our first song. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for those that came out. Thank you, God, for the beautiful day that you've given us. And Lord, I pray that you'll just be with us this morning and that you'll just uh, help us to be a blessing to you, to uplift you, to honor you in everything that we do here this morning. Lord, I ask that you'll touch Hugh there in hospital. I pray that you'll just uh, strengthen him, help him. And I pray that the doctors will be able to find out what's going on with him, Lord, that they can help him to, to recover. And Lord, I pray you be with us here, that we'll be um, servants unto you, and we'll look to please you. And God, I ask that you'll touch the other churches this morning that are meeting, and bless them and help them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go to our first song. Make sure we got our words up today. And uh, even though we can't sing, we'll have the words up this morning. microphone on. Uh, it fell off my side and I was trying to rebuild it there for a moment, so I apologize for that as well. Uh, but let's uh, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter number 3. Genesis chapter 3, we're going to read several verses this morning, uh, and, and I believe this will be the end of uh, our study here for now. There are some things that as you study, you see other things, and I, I was telling Brother Stagner last night, I said I've been looking at Genesis 3, and uh, everything keeps growing, and, uh, but I want to stay focused upon what God's got upon our heart, and I, don't wanna, I told him I don't want to go rabbit hunting. You've heard of chasing rabbits, and there's so many here that you could chase. And so we will go back to this text sometime later and look at some other things that are here, 
But we want to continue on with what God's had on our heart the last couple of weeks. So if you would stand, we're going to read in Genesis chapter number 3. We're going to start reading in the first verse, and we're going to read down through probably verse 19 or so. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know in that day, I'm sorry, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree did be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this? that thou hast done. And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, and thy conception in sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou sh shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return into the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and to dust shalt thou return. Thank you for standing. You can be seated this morning. We'll go back and look at this text here in just a moment and try to give you what the Lord has upon our heart. And we'll go to our second song this morning. I hope it be a blessing to you. Glory would come to live with. 
soul just to know that he really loves me. When I think of who he is and who I am, for he's more wonderful than my mind can conceive. He's more wonderful than my heart can believe. He goes beyond my highest hope. so much more. He's more than amazing, more than marvelous, more than miraculous could ever be. He's more than wonderful. That's what Jesus is to me. us uh, those recordings of his daughters singing and that's a, just a tremendous song I love that it's a blessing uh, to hear well this morning we're going to be back in Genesis 3 where we've been the last couple of weeks and uh, I think as far as I know as far as dealing with the subject we've been dealing with this will be probably be the end uh, looking at this text but uh, we'll see what the Lord uh, puts upon our heart for next time. But I want to go back and read just a few verses. You don't have to stand. You've already stood this morning, but back in Genesis 3. And I want to look at verse 14, and I'm going to read down if, probably to the end of the chapter, and uh, then we'll give you what's upon our heart. Genesis chapter number 3, verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, and thy conception in sorrow shalt thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return into the ground. For out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and the dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. The Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed the, in the, at the east of the garden Eden of Cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Lord, thank you again for letting us be here. And Lord, I want to ask you that you touch me and touch my mind, my heart, Lord, this morning. And you clean up my life, Lord, if where I may have failed you. And make me able to stand this morning to speak your word. And I ask God that you'll speak through me and keep my... Help me to keep myself out as much as I can and just let you speak this morning. And I pray that we open our hearts and our minds to be receptive of what you want us to hear and what you want us to apply, not just here, but to put into practice in our lives. And God, I ask you to touch every other man of God that stands this morning and bless them and help them. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we've saw through this uh, study we've done over the last few weeks. Adam and Eve fall into sin. They were really only given, Brother Mark, one rule to follow, and that was to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One tree they could not eat of, but they couldn't abide by that rule. They couldn't keep one rule. 
Uh, and they gave into their flesh and they fell into sin. And we look at that today and we think, well, why couldn't they just obey one rule? You know what? Uh, we would have done the same thing. We would have failed. We would have failed. And they fell into sin, and that sin we talked about last week affected their behavior. That once close relationship they had with God, uh, meeting in the garden in the cool of the day, they hindered that relationship. It wasn't the same. They hid themselves from God. They tried to cover up their skin, and both of them made excuse as to why they had committed the sin. And often we've talked about over the last several months, the temptation of sin and how powerful it is and how it draws at us and it pulls at us. Satan makes it, makes it appear wonderful and pleasurable. And it is pleasure under the flesh. But he hides the darkness of sin and what it really is and what it truly does in our life. Our flesh is enticed. Our mind is, is attracted unto sin, but it has adverse effects upon our life. And if we're not careful, we'll fall into sin and that sin has consequences is what we're going to talk about this morning. No doubt everyone here has fallen. And everybody here, the, that, that fall into sin, that sin that you partook of, it changed you. It made you act differently. But it has a continuous effect. It doesn't just stop there. Sin, until it is dealt with, continuously affects our life. It changes our behavior as we talked about. And it does have consequences. Not, not good consequences, but dark, negative consequences. No matter what we do to hide it, the consequences will remain in our life. No matter how much we think, well, it'll just go away. I'll forget about it. Nobody will ever know. The consequences of sin will still come in your life. I'll quickly mention these things. This is some things we'll go back later and look at. But I'll quickly mention the consequences that the serpent faced. We don't know what it looked like before, but we from, from, from verse 14 here, it says, And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat uh, all the days of thy life. So it appears that it once walked on legs, but now it would be on its belly. It would eat dust. That's a sign of defeat, laying there on, on, on its belly, crawling around, eating dust. There would be enmity between the serpent and woman. There would be a, if you think about this just practically thinking, not looking deep spiritually, but you think about what, how do we feel about serpents, about snakes in the day we live? We don't like them, do we? Uh, here, thank God that you don't have a lot of snakes, but where I'm from, you've got to be careful. There's copperheads, there's rattlesnakes, and there's those that will hurt you. And, and there's enmity between mankind and snakes, isn't there? If you just think practically, there's the curse the consequence. And of course there is enmity between mankind and Satan. Satan used that serpent. Satan was there in that serpent. But there's enmity between us. But he also says, And I'll put enmity between thee and woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Again, this is something we don't have time to deal with this morning, but I want to briefly mention, we're told of Satan's defeat. Right there. And it's a foretelling that Christ, who would be born of a, of a woman, of a virgin woman, and how Satan would be defeated in the end. He'll be crushed. He'll, he'll bruise his head. And there's much more we see dealing with this. but we, I, won't, I don't want to chase those things this morning. I want to get to where God wants us to be. But I did want to briefly mention them. I want us to focus on the consequences that came specifically upon Adam and Eve. And the first thing that sin brought about, and we mentioned this just briefly a little bit last week, was shame. The consequence that came from their sin was shame. We saw that in their action of hiding. But let's look at it just a little closer this morning because it is a direct consequence of sin upon you and I as well. They knew once their eyes were open that they had done wrong. They saw that they were naked. I imagine uh, the first time they saw each other after that sin that they tried to hide from one another. We do know, uh, that's just in my thoughts, they realized uh, that they were naked and they, they felt shame. Standing there. But when we do know that they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Sin brought shame to their mind and to their soul like they'd never felt before. They never felt anything like that. And when you and I fall into sin, it fills us with shame. Oh, the sin is exciting. It's pleasurable. It's enjoyable. And man, it feels wonderful while you're committing the sin. But once we truly see what we've done, 
especially as saved people, the Holy Spirit within us brings about conviction. And that conviction causes us to feel dirty, causes us to feel regret, and there's shame. Even in those secret sins that no one else ever sees, we know what we've done, and shame fills our life. How many of you have sit under preaching? And the Holy Spirit uses that preacher. He don't know what you've done. He don't know where you've been. But the preacher begins to preach, and he speaks specifically on the sin that you've committed. Anybody ever? I've done that. I've sat there, and that man of God has no idea where I'm at in my life, but it's like he's been walking around with me. And the Holy Spirit uses that preacher, and you sit there in your seat, and you wish you could disappear. You wish you could just get up and run out. You get uncomfortable. You may even start to squirm a little bit in your seat because of the conviction that comes, because of the shame that that sin brought to your life. And here you are, the Lord is calling you out on it. It's a direct consequence of sin. I think we, we may have read this verse last week, but we'll read it again. Uh, I know we read a few of these last week, but Proverbs 11 and 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Pride leads to sin, and we saw that in Eve with her desire. She saw that that tree was one to make one wise, uh, to become like God's. And it led her to take of that fruit and commit sin. And the scripture tells us that after that sin, she had shame. She wanted to cover herself. I know I mentioned this verse last week, Proverbs 16, 18, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride guides us to do as we please, and often leads us into sin when we give into it. And that pride brings about sin, and the product of sin comes shame. Think about this, we all know the story of Peter and, and the Lord told him, uh, told him that he would deny him and he said, oh no, I'll, I won't do that. But then we know he denied Christ. In doing so, in that denial, Brother Alwyn, he lied. He said, I don't know this man. But he didn't just lie, he progressed into cursing and swearing that he knew not Christ. And then look what happened after that. Matthew 26 and verse 75 says, And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And look what happened. And he went out and wept bitterly. You know why he wept bitterly? Shame set in. He realized, I have sinned. I've lied. I've denied Christ, but I lied. And I've cursed and I've swore. I've done exactly what I said I would not do. Shame produces blemishes in our lives. I can speak for myself here. I've often uh, uh, forget any. How many? Uh, I've said this before, and I'll try to explain it real quickly. I often forget anything good that I may have done in my life. There's very little good I have done, but anything good it doesn't stick with my mind. But it seems certain things I come across always remind me of the negative things I've done. Anybody else like that? You forget the good things, but man, those negative things are right there. And that shame creates that in our life. Our minds hold on to that shame of sin. Others no doubt could testify this morning and say, I'm still ashamed of my past and we should be ashamed. We should never glorify what we used to be. Because sin's shameful. We don't want it to be exposed. We want it to be in the past. But all that shame we feel over our past could have been avoided if we had just not allowed ourselves to fall because that is a consequence of sin. There's also the consequence of sorrow. Look in verse number 16 of chapter 3. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. Verse number 17 says, Cursed is the ground for thy sake in sorrow. Shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And we'll look at that again here in a little bit. These two had never known sorrow before. I do believe there was a little bit of labor in there. I think God created man and in His image and we're to work. And that's a message for another time. But this was joyful labor. Nothing was difficult. There had no worries. There was no problems, no issues. They had a perfect life before sin, but sin produced 
sorrow in their life. Because of their sin, Brother Mark, we have sorrow in the world today. A blanket of sin and sorrow across our world. Job 14.1 says, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. John 16.33, Christ said in the world, You shall have tribulation. Their sin's consequence, their specific sin, had a consequence that lives on today in the sorrow of the lives of the whole world. The reason we face sorrow today is because of their sin. We can't escape the troubles of this world because of sin. The world's tainted by sin. But there's also, in our personal life, our personal sin, there is also the consequence of personal sorrow that comes. What does sorrow mean? It means pain, hardship, toil. We've all felt sorrow. But sin produces sorrow in our lives that could be avoided if we just didn't dabble in sin. We create more sorrow in our lives when we play around with sin. We've talked about David and we've referenced him probably each time we've looked at this chapter. He committed adultery that night. Committed murder to cover his adultery. Bathsheba, by the way, also sinned that night. We'll look at that sometime later. And in their sin, Bathsheba conceived a child The Bible talks about David weeping and praying for that child, for that baby. But the baby died and sorrow followed their sin. He committed sorrow, he committed sin and he lost a baby. There was sorrow there. Sorrow over the guilt of his sin, but sorrow over that he's he's lost a child now. I believe it'd be a direct consequence of what he did. Sorrow is a consequence of sin. Sorrow over the over the pain that sin brings. Sin's always accompanied by pain and trouble. Sorrow over the mistakes we've made and the troubles that follow our sin. I'll give you a little example uh, this morning. If we tell a lie, you know what usually happens? It turns into another lie. And then another lie. It turns into hurt feelings when we're lying to others. It turns into broken relationships because of lies. And it will rob us, Brother Mark, of any respect and any trust, any confidence that we had with anyone else. Brings about sorrow. Drug use usually starts with something simple. Someone will take some little little drug and say, well, I can handle it. Then comes the second time. Then follows, they move on to other substances. And it brings sorrow to that person, to that family. Financial loss, friendship loss. And sorrow plagues their life. And you see that in the life of people that go down that road. Drinking alcohol, pornography, cheating, stealing. On and on we could go and give examples, but we don't have time to do that this morning. There's multiple examples of sin in our lives, but they all start out as one little thing, and then they grow into an addiction, an attraction. And then as we dabble in those things, right behind us is sorrow that follows the path of sin. Sorrow comes from the sin of disobedience. I'm going to give you an example, a personal example in my life. I may have told this before, I don't know, but years ago we were driving on a, on a little holiday and Riley was just little and we stopped over to eat at Cracker Barrel. You don't have Cracker Barrel here, but Cracker Barrel is just a, we'll preach on Cracker Barrel a minute, just a good old country restaurant. You may have been to Cracker Barrel before, have you, Brother Allen? Oh man, the, Good biscuits and that white milk gravy. Back to what we're talking about. We stopped off to eat. And there was a man, as I exited what we, the motorway, what we call the interstate in the U.S., I was exiting there, and there was a man, and we we've saw people standing on the road before holding signs that they're needy. And, uh, but this man was right in my window, and Brother Alwyn, I, I immediately knew. The Lord spoke to my heart. I didn't know audible voice, but he impressed upon me to speak to that man. And I sat there and I said, it seemed seemed like forever. But then traffic moved and I had to go. There was people behind me. I didn't speak to it. We went and ate and Wendy said, what's wrong with you? I said, I'm just going to be honest with you. The Lord told me to talk to that man back there and I didn't do it. I said, but I'm going to go do it now. We get through eating. I'm going to go back by there. And if he's still there, I'm going to go buy him something to eat. And I'm going to sit on the side of the road and talk to him. 
But you know what happened? I went back, Alan. He wasn't there. He was gone. Nowhere to be found. That's been 14, 14 or 15 years now. And the sorrow still hits my heart. Because there's a reason God wanted me to speak to him. And he could have been lost. And I disobeyed God. And he may still be lost. Because somebody, it could be that nobody's ever shared the gospel with him. But it was my place to do that. And I was disobedient to God. And disobedience is a sin. And I still feel sorrow all those years later. I'll show you how disobedience is sin. 1 Samuel 15 verse 22. We know that Saul had disobeyed God. Samuel's talking to him here. He says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of God, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Disobedience is a sin too, and it brings about sorrow. Nothing good will ever come from sin in our life when we go against God's word when we partake in sin, when we disobey Him. And it brings about that sorrow. And another consequence of sin that we see that goes hand in hand with sorrow is scars. This sorrow happened in the lives of Adam and Eve here that we read about. But it wasn't temporary. It was from that day forward until the, until the day they died, there was the consequences in their life of sin and that brought scars. There would be sorrow in childbirth. Now, I have no doubt that childbirth would have... I, I don't understand it, but according to the Word of God, if there's going to be sorrow now in childbirth, Brother Alwyn, wouldn't you think that there wasn't going to be sorrow before? It, would be, it, wouldn't, be, it wouldn't have any difficulty, but it brought difficulty because of sin. What would have been a painless event was now scarred with pain. The woman's desire would now be to the man as he ruled over her. Now the woman was always given to be the helpmeet unto the man. Genesis 2.18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. You, if you look on down in verse 22, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his, of the, of his ribs... And closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman. And brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones. And flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman. Because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. And shall cleave unto his wife. And they shall be one flesh. Her role was one that she did without a problem before. She was to be the helpmeet to the man. And the man... Was to, was to be her leader. But notice the term God uses after sin. It's not help me. He said, He shall rule over thee. Your, her desires were going to become secondary to His desires. We'll go back and look at this another time uh, because I, I want to definitely go back and look at that as the family dynamic changed here. But i got to mention it briefly. But now the woman is going to struggle in her role, in her submission. And what do you mean by that? You can see that still today. The woman is still, and I'm, this is not Preston, this is the Word of God, is supposed to be submissive unto the man. But we see even today that that struggle began to take place for her to fulfill her role because of sin. There's so much to say and see in the marriage here, and we'll look at that later on. But even, I don't want to stop with just her, I believe even the man begins to struggle in his relationship. He wants to exert and be a dictator instead of one of sacrifice. We see today that the man is just as guilty as the woman of not fulfilling their role. You know why that came? It's a scar of sin that hits the marriage and hits the home. Matthew Henry said this. I don't know if any of you ever read some of his stuff, but I like to read, read a few of his things. And he said, If man had not sinned, he would have always ruled with wisdom and love. And if the woman had not sinned, she would always have obeyed with humility and meekness. And then the dominion would have been no grievance. But sin scarred the relationship between man and woman. The ground was also scarred. It was cursed. Hard labor would now plague the man as he looked to eat of the ground. 
I'd like to know how it was before. We don't know. We don't, we don't understand that. But I just imagine that whatever they wanted was there and they just picked it up. But now, thorns and thistles would grow as we see today. How many of you uh, are like me in, uh, in your garden? The thorns and the thistles grow real, real quickly, but the stuff you'll want to grow doesn't really grow that well. It seems like the thorns and the thistles, the, the, the curse, they grow more and more quickly. Weeds, unwanted growth comes up faster and more abundant than the fruit. They have to be cleared out so that the good can grow or they'll choke a lot of the good things out. The work that they did before became difficult. If there's thorns there, doesn't it stand to reason, Brother Mark, that those thorns would probably pierce your finger? Roses are beautiful, aren't they? But if you go to grab a rose, you better be careful. There's thorns right behind that beauty. The sweat of thy face. Hey, now man's going to have to sweat. No doubt calluses and cuts and bruises came from the labor because of the scar of sin. And I imagine, and maybe you imagine too, that every time Eve gave birth and that pain hit her, she remembered that scar that came into her life because of sin. Every time Adam looked down at his hands and he, and, he, and he came in from a hard day's work and he was just worn out and tired, he had never felt that before, he saw and felt the scars that sin caused. Reminded of the day that he took of that fruit and thought, man, what did I do? When their children ran up to them and said, Daddy, Mama, I'm hungry. And they had to go out and labor to pick food and to have food for them. They were reminded of how easy things were before the scar of sin hit their life. When Adam and Eve looked at each other, when there was tension in the marriage at the home because of that scar, it reminded them of what they had done. And sin will fill our lives just like it did them, full of scars. I know good men, I know good women that gave in to sin. Some, Brother Mark, that have repented. They've, the Lord has forgiven them of what they've done. But you know what? The scar did not go away. The scar remains. People never forget our sin. We never forget our sin. You know that scar of when we're reminded, even though we're forgiven, how many of you have that problem? There's still a scar there. God wipes it away, but we never forget. The people in our life, they never forget. Even if we get forgiveness and we never touch that sin again, we'll remember it. The people that know we did it will remember it. The scar remains. Let me just put this in your mind so you can see what I'm coming from here. How many of you ever been around someone or know someone that did something wicked? Not, not talking about yourself right now, but someone else did something wicked and vile. Every, all of us know someone. And maybe that person, and how many of you have known a person that did something and, and they appeared to have changed? They've gotten forgiveness and they're on the right track. Probably we all have. But tell me this. Have you ever in your mind wondered, are they really different? And when a situation comes up, it's still in your mind as to what they've done. Anybody like that? You, you remember it. It never goes away. That's the scar. That's another scar of sin that remains how other people view us. Because it's always in our mind. Some people cross lines that bring about injury or, or some type of disease that will plague them forever. We're, we mentioned drugs earlier that they have an effect upon your mind, upon your body, sometimes permanent. Certain sins we can get out in can disease our body. I know some people right now that are saved. And they'll tell you that their mind is not what it used to be because of some sin they expose themselves to, some things they've done in their life, and that their body is not the same as it used to be. We mentioned drinking. One that drinks, gets out behind the wheel, and kills another person. But they get forgiveness of it. The Lord forgives them and wipes their sin away, but does that bring that person's life back? It doesn't. They still live with the fact that their sin took a life or that they hurt themselves. Those scars remain. Physical scars, mental scars, emotional scars. One of my favorite Bible characters, and we're going to deal with her at some point, I know, because I just love preaching upon her, is Rahab. But what is Rahab known as? The harlot. Rahab the harlot. And I believe that Rahab 
trusted in God. Joshua 2.11 says, And as soon as we, this is her speaking, As soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any, man, any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and earth beneath. She recognized who God was. And we know the story of Rahab. Don't have time to deal with it all. She's even in the bloodline of Jesus Christ. But you know what she's still known as? Rahab the harlot. It still lives on as an identifier of who she is. Jonah was a, was a preacher, a man of God, a prophet. And we don't know a lot about Jonah other than what happened in the book of Jonah. Well, there's very little mention of Jonah. And no doubt he done some great things, but what do we remember him for? His sin, his disobedience. Samson, as I've mentioned him uh, in the prior weeks, man, uh, he, he, he was, uh, had a, God had his hand upon Samson. But what do we remember him for? His sin. Peter says this of Lot in 2 Peter chapter number 2, and turning to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered, listen to this, just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Lot was a believer in God. Peter says a righteous man. But what do we remember him for? His sin. His mistake of going into Sodom taking his family there and living among those people. Yes, God will forgive, praise his name that he's faithful and just to forgive our sins, but the sin will produce scars that will remain in our lives. Sometimes scars that we will never get rid of. Would any of you intentionally cut yourself and produce a scar on your skin? No, we wouldn't do that. People pay thousands of pounds to remove blemishes and, and, and to, to enhance their beauty. But when we dabble in sin, we intentionally scar our lives. Before you decide to cross the line, you need to think about the scar that may come from your sin. You may create a blemish in your life that will damage you forever. Your testimony destroyed. Your family destroyed. Everything good gone. You can be forgiven, no doubt about that. But the scar may live on. I've got to hurry this morning. I want to get this finished. When we dabble in sin, it also has a consequence of separation. Look in Genesis chapter 3 with me again for just a moment in verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Adam and Eve were separated from the home the Lord had given them, had placed them in. They lost the beauty of the garden. They were driven out. There were cherubims at the east of the garden to guard it. There was a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the tree of life secure. Sin creates separation from the good things in our life. We discussed the hindrance that comes in the relationship that we have with God last week because of our sin. And definitely, there's a separation there. It causes loss. We referred to David's sin a few times and. Uh, look what he had to say in Psalm 51. He was repenting of his sin. And look at some words he says here. We know that he committed the sin of adultery, he committed murder, uh, and we'll look at him later on. But in Psalm 51, he was, he was, uh, he was uh, uh, repenting. He said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He wanted his heart clean again. He had lost, he had been separated from the cleanliness that he once had. He wanted to... He wanted to get right with God because there was a separation there from what he had before. He said, Restore unto me the joy of, my, of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. 
David had been separated from joy. Why? Because of his sin. And he was asking God, I'm, forgive me, restore the joy of thy salvation that I once had. Sin will separate us from our joy, from our, uh, from our cleanliness. 1 John 1, 6 says, if we, have, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. When we walk in sin, we're separated from the fellowship with God. Sin has broken so many relationships. I've saw churches fall apart because of the sin that has made its way in. It robs people of their joy, of the clean life that they were, were once living. Adam and Eve were separated from the garden God had placed them in. Separated from everything good. And separation is a consequence of sin that brings loss in our life. Lastly this morning, sin will have the consequence of spreading. It will spread. Look in Genesis chapter 4 real quickly, verse number 2. So, Cain has been born. And then in verse number 2 it says, and she, again she, and she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, as he brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. And his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt, thou, shalt not thou be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Adam and Eve sinned. They lost their home and they lost so much already, but now it's spread into their family. Cain was a tiller of the ground, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep. They had to work hard, just like mom and dad had to. They had to labor. The curse lived on in their lives. It spread. It spread unto us. But we also see the personal effect of sin upon their sons. Cain was slack in his faith. Cain did what he could do just to get by. Both Cain and Abel brought sacrifices unto God. And notice Abel's. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. Abel trusted God, had faith in God, and he gave the best that he had, the very best, the first. He sacrificed it and gave it unto the Lord. But Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Cain's was not his best. The Bible says, that Abel's was more excellent. Hebrews 11, 4, I'm talking about Cain's faith and Abel's faith right now. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead, yet speaketh. Abel's was offered by faith, giving his best, wanting to be pleasing unto God. Abel looked unto God to give God glory and to obey God's rule, and he gave his best. But Cain, and we don't, well, I'm not going to deal with this deeply this morning, but Cain just went through the process. This is what I imagine Cain's mind. Well, I guess it's time to sacrifice. Let me gather up a little fruit and I'll take it. And Cain got mad because it was rejected. And God said to him, when he was angry, he said, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? That tells us he didn't do well. He didn't come in faith. He didn't come giving his best. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Cain didn't do well in his offering. He just did what he could to get by. He was unconcerned with doing his best. He was slacking his faith. It's a result of that sin. It spread on. It, had a, it started affecting their children. 
But it didn't stop there. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. See how this sin spreads? Adam and Eve took of a fruit. We talked about the shame they felt and the sorrow that came and the scars that came. But now it's affecting their family. Cain committed murder. Now, well, first we'll say this. They lost their son Abel. Losing a son is bad enough, but knowing that the other son was the one that murdered him. They, in, in, in a way, lost two that day to sin. The consequences affected more than just them. It spread into their family. And sin will spread and affect those close to us. Our children watch our behavior. And we're going to deal with the family sometime as the Lord gives us guidance. But can I tell you this, Mark? Well, everybody here has children. I started to say Mark, but we, we all have children other than my kids. You better not have children yet. But Brother Mark, our children watch our behavior, and you know they become more like us than we really know. Brother Alwyn, do you have some of your father's characteristics? Yeah, we do. And I find that in my life. And you do, it's, it's not intentional, but, you, but you're raised by them and you take on some of their good attributes and also some of their bad ones. And our children watch us. And they become more like us than we realize. And we must be careful of sin because it will spread into their lives and it will continue costing us as we see it affect them. We must train them in the way they should go. Be careful what we spread into our family. We mentioned Lot just a moment ago. and uh, He dwelled in Sodom. He chose to go live down in Sodom and he lived among the wicked. He made a home there. Enjoyed himself there. His family grew up there. He wasn't standing up for what's right. We don't read any time where he's speaking of the Lord or trying to do any, any work for the Lord while he's there. And whenever the Lord sent those men there to say, hey, you're going to have to get out because God's going to destroy the city. He went and spoke to his daughters and his sons-in-laws and they, they pretty much laughed at it. And he had to leave them behind. And they faced destruction in that city because why? They chose to stay there because they had, their father had taken them there. And they got used to that life and they didn't want to leave that behind. Then his wife loved the place so much that she turned back when she was told not to, when they were told not to look back, just to go and get out. She became a pillar of salt. The other two daughters that did survive and left there with him committed, got him drunk and committed incest with him. Why do you mention all that? Lot's sin affected his whole family. And that's why he's remembered for the way that he was. David, again, whom we'll look at closer later on, sin. And the sword never departed his house. We'll show you sometime that the sins he committed, all of them showed up in his children. And the result of Cain's sin directly spread from what Adam and Eve did that day. Not only did Cain inherit their sin, but it affected all mankind. We have an inherited sin nature as a world. It spread. When we choose to play with sin, it spreads to others. It spreads in its, in its own growth to doing other things, and it has a great effect. Can you imagine when they found out that Cain killed Abel and how they looked back and said, you remember what we did in the garden? How they remembered that sin that they committed. Oh, had we never done that. Now they were mourning over their sin, over the sin of their son, and over the loss of a son. Sin will affect more than just you. It can influence others. Definitely. I mentioned that about being in the family. We can influence our children. We can influence one another into doing things that we shouldn't be doing. But it also brings about hurt to others. Maybe they're not partaking in the sin, but it still hurts them. Others will have sorrow because of your sin. I know families that their children are out in sin and they, they are facing sorrow. It hurts them. It pains them to see what they're going through. Others will have to deal with the scars that come from your sin. They'll have to deal with the embarrassment. Others will feel the effects of the separation that sin brings. 
mentioned drugs and alcohol just a little bit ago, and it's the reason we mention that more than anything because it's very prevalent. But I saw it rip homes apart and where the one that's the addict really don't care very much about what's going on, but the mother, the father, the brothers, the sisters, they mourn and, and they worry over that one. That sin spreads and affects everybody around us. I've got to hurry and close. It has a lasting effect. Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap. I'm sorry, he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. If you dabble in sin, can I just be blunt this morning? Expect consequences. They're going to come. Don't think it's going to be free. There's so many consequences of sin. We see some here. Adam and Eve never thought of taking that fruit would cost them so much. Never thought about the sorrow, about the separation, about the scars, about it spreading. Had they knew what it would cost them, I wonder if they would have thought, thought more than just those few minutes there. They would have thought twice about what they were about to do. But their minds were upon the temporary pleasure and not upon the troubles that sin was going to bring. And as we close down, I want to just briefly say, sin also has the consequences of death. Maybe somebody listening, maybe somebody here. I don't know anybody's heart but my own. Mankind faces physical death because of sin. We know that. Return to the dust. And that's what we'll do. Unless the Lord comes back before we die, we'll face death. But also those that do not trust in Christ as Savior will face death and hell for all eternity. For the wages of sin is death. Those that do not accept Christ are condemned because they have not believed upon the only begotten Son of God, not accepted what He done for them. But thanks be to God, everybody has the choice where they can be forgiven. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The rest of Romans 6.23 I just quoted a moment ago, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin brings forth death, but the gift of God brings forth life. If you've never been saved, if you're listening today and you've never been saved, all you've got to do is call out on Him. Believe in what He did. Trust, put your faith in Him as Savior. In His death, His burial, His resurrection, that He paid for your sin. He'll save you. And one day, yes, physical death will come, but you'll have life eternal with Him. Us that are saved, I want to say this, sin's dangerous. It's so dangerous. And it's, even though we're born again, sin still has consequences that can ruin our lives. I don't know if you know this old song or not, but it says this, Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Slowly but wholly taking control. Sin will leave you longer than you want to stay. Sin will cost you far more than you want to pay. And I believe the last several weeks the Lord has been trying to warn us, trying to remind us that our flesh is weak, we must be careful not to fall into sin because it will change us. And the consequences that come in our life are very costly. For one little moment of pleasure, years of consequences can come. The pleasure of sin fades quickly, but the consequences are long-lasting. And if you're dwelling in sin today, I don't know anybody's heart, anybody's life other than my own. Turn to the Lord. 1 John 1, 9, I mentioned this earlier and I'm going to close with it. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're about to cross that line, go to Him before you cross it. If you've crossed that line, go to Him and ask Him to forgive you. Don't let it take hold in your life and suffer the consequences that it may bring. Lord, thank You for the good liberty this morning. I pray that You'll just take Your Word and let us apply it to our life. Let this be a warning unto us. And I pray that you'll just move in hearts that are listening online and those that are here today. And upon my own heart, God, help us all remember what sin can do. In Jesus' name, amen.
and I forgot to turn my microphone again. Um, I'm going to have to have to have you remind me. Alvin usually reminds me of that, but I, I forgot. But uh, yeah, I, I apologize for going a few minutes longer. But I say apologize. I just I felt like it's what the Lord wanted us to do, and so I hope it was a help to you. Uh, remember service on Thursday, five o'clock. We may be taking a break from um, just for a week or two uh, from our study on the King James Bible, uh, just to give Bill a, a little break and. And then uh, he didn't ask for that, but I told him we may just take a break. Uh, I got something that I may want to want to preach on the next two weeks, and then we'll pick back up with him after that. But I'll we'll, I'll know more Thursday. I'm just praying about it right now. So, but still remember the service on, at five o'clock on Thursday, and then remember we got the offering plates in the back. So uh, come go by if you have your tithe and offering this week, and put it there in the plate, and we'll make sure it gets put in its place. So let's go, Lord, in prayer and ask His blessing upon the remainder of the day, and we'll be dismissed. Lord, thank You for the good service. Thank You for the, those that came out. And I pray that uh, You'll just take uh, what You've done here this morning and use it for Your honor and glory. And I pray, God, You'll just be with us. Help us, Lord, to be a witness unto others throughout the week. I pray You'll bless the church here and just give us a heart to love people and want to see people saved. And Lord, I ask that you'll be with each one as we part ways, that uh, you'll give them a good remainder of the day. And thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.